This program is brought to you by Training Tilt. Training Tilt is a complete toolkit for coaches, health and fitness professionals, and nutritionists. Combine your website, e commerce needs, client communications, and training plans into a single affordable platform. For more information, please go to www.lisatamati.co.nz forward slash training tilt. Welcome, Welcome to Pushing the Limits, the podcast that gets deep into the psyche of extraordinary achievers across all genres, cutting to the chase to unlock the secrets of their success, their achievement, philosophies, and motivations. Join us in the quest to find out what makes the movers and shakers of our world tick and what gems and wisdom we can learn from them. Well, hi, everybody. It's Lisa Tamady here at Pushing the Limits. Man, I am so excited today. I can hardly sit still. I've got one of my heroes on the line all the way from America, and you're not going to believe the coup that I've managed to get. This is pretty amazing. I've got one of the world's best ultramarathon runners on with me, and I've had some pretty big stars over, over the time that I've been doing this podcast, but this one really rates right up there. He's a, he's a man with an incredibly interesting and colourful and rich tapestry of a life. Um, he's a runner, but he's so much more than that. Um, and he has, he's a man who's most well known for running the entire Sahara uh, with two others um, as well. And they ran 4,500 miles in 111 days. Now, I've done a couple of thousand kilometers in the Sahara in bits and pieces. And I cannot comprehend what these guys did. It's absolutely off the charts. And that was just one of his accomplishments, one of the big ones. So welcome to the show, Charlie Engel. Thank you so much for taking the time today, Charlie. Lisa, it's my pleasure. Thanks for that great intro. I need, I need to have you around all the time. Just to introduce me. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, mate, it's, it's really well deserved. I, I'm in absolute awe of you um, and what you've achieved. Um, Charlie, let's. Uh, I want to dive really deep in, in, into your mindset, really, and your your life philosophy. And, and uh, I want the, the the listeners to come on a bit of a journey with us from your early days. Um, and you've had a you know well publicised um, um, journey with an addiction to drugs and alcohol in your early life. Um, so let's yeah, let's start there. Let's start back way before you even got into the ultra marathon running scene with. You know, growing up and, um, you know, the, the, the demons that you faced with drugs and alcohol and, and then what happened after that? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. I, I mean, it's a, it is a crazy, it's a crazy trip and I've learned through the years um, and I will talk about that in a second, but there's so many people in the ultra community who have some relationship with addiction, whether <laughs> not necessarily drug and alcohol addiction, but there's a, uh, I think there's a drive and a, you know, something about our personalities that even if a person had never touched drugs or alcohol, there's a, a personality trait that's very common with, with ultra distance athletes of all kinds. And I, I think that for me, you know, my addiction, I mean, I guess you could say it started when I was born, but, you know, I grew up in a house with uh, a lot of alcohol, a lot of drugs and, you know, I was a bit of an overachiever in high school and decided to sort of go a different way. Um, sports, you know, I did well in school and dated the cheerleader whenever I could, when I, whenever I could. And, and you know, and I, I had a, a fairly um, normal, maybe even high achieving life in high school. And then I went off to college and I was 17 and I I got there and I sort of realized that I was pretty, uh, that I was actually pretty average. <laughs> that, <laughs> that was shock know, horror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, there was, I thought there would maybe be a big sign that said, you know, welcome Charlie when I got to college. And, you know, yeah. Apparently they didn't know I was coming. And so, you know, I, I get there and I, I realize there's a lot of people who are great students and smart and good athletes. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, it was at a time where, you know, I don't actually know what the drinking age is in New Zealand, but at the time in the U.S., at, at least in North Carolina where I lived, you could buy beer and wine at 18. Yep. And, yep. yeah, and so, you know, I I discovered pretty quickly in college that I had freedom and I liked to drink. <laughs> and uh, so I set about making a reputation for myself that way and <laughs> went off the just, rails but 
Yeah, so I, I always say I became an All American uh, first <laughs> first team guy in uh, in drinking, and you know, and then the re- you know, look, we've all read and listened to lots of stories about about addicts, and it all kind of goes the same way. You know, you go down this this long and winding dark path, and you know, mine lasted about ten years, and it was. It was primarily cocaine and drinking, and in the last few years, I unfortunately discovered crack, and that became wow. my, wow. you know, it became my obsession uh, for the last few years, and and it, uh, you know, my I, I didn't think I was going to survive it, quite frankly, yep. and I, I don't know if I cared if I would for a while, yep. and. Uh, when I was 29, I um, I was in a, uh, I'll just take a second to describe the final binge. You know, I was in Wichita, Kansas, mm-hmm. in the middle of the country, and I was working, and, and uh, my first son had been born. And uh, Brett, you know, I thought Brett would be the thing that would finally bring me out of it. Yep. You know, because I knew okay. I didn't want to raise, I didn't want to raise kids in that environment. Yep. And, and um, you know, so I was. Uh, I kept it together for a couple of months and, and sure enough, eventually there, there came that day when I didn't and, and that binge ended, you know, after six days and someone had shot at my car and put three bullet wow. holes in, it, you know, while I was driving and, you know, they were trying to shoot me and the police are going through my car and they pull out a crack pipe and, you know, and I just remember, I remember all of those little snapshots of moments like they were yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, I knew at that moment that I needed to change. I either needed, I was going to die or I was going to change. Yep. And I went to a recovery meeting that night and the next morning I got on, I got up and I put on my running shoes and, and just you know, I ran, I ran every single day for the next three years and wow. without missing a day. And, and running, you know, running saved my life. And then, and then it went on to give me a life. Yeah. And, I mean, and, and what a way to start. And, you know, I, I've got an addictive personality. I've never had an addiction to drugs and alcohol, but I know that I have an addictive personality. And I, I agree with you that I'd say most of, of uh, or a lot of the extreme athletes that I've met and talked to, we've had issues over the years in some way, shape or form. What is it that makes the the person who has an addictive personality you think different? Are we just wired different from day one, a genetic thing, or is it something that that um, yes. it happens to <laughs> us? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think it is. I I do think we're wired, and I mean, I I look. I always say that I think that that we're you know it's a gift though because for a while I think when I first quit I thought that I needed to eliminate that part of my personality that I like I needed like if I could take a knife and cut out the addict I would do it today I wouldn't you know if you could give me a pill and make all that go away and I could drink like a normal person I would never do it because it's it the addiction part of my personality is actually what makes me good at things it makes me a pretty good writer. It makes me a decent runner. It makes me stubborn as hell. And, you know, and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to lose those traits. Now it comes with some, you know, I can be an overbearing asshole. I can, (laughs) I can be, you know, there's a lot of things. As I've gotten older though, I've learned that, you know, the words I apologize go a long way. And, you know, I have to, I I have to start I have to strike that balance, you know, sometimes. Yeah, totally. Uh, and you are, you are the, I think you have, it is a gift in the way, because I, I'm wired the same way, that, you know, o- overachieving or driving and determination beyond what most people can comprehend, if you've got a bee in your bonnet, and that's what you're going for, yep. good, bad or otherwise. Um, and that makes you really powerful in the fact that you can, you can overcome obstacles, that that would otherwise, uh, you know, never get you there. But at the same time, the flip side of that is is actually a, a weakness as well. Um, it, it means that you're whole, you're not necessarily always in balance, and you're you're always um, in in a in a constant flux state of of I don't know, learning and growing and 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 
on fire and running and people have trouble I think keeping up keeping up with you not not physically keeping up but I mean uh with the pace that you live life at in the, yeah. the um you know it can be really really tiring on your family and your your friends and yeah like you said you can be an overbearing asshole at times you know I know <laughs> when you've got that drive um yeah. that, that that sometimes is part of that that personality structure but you've managed to turn so you went in from that that really mm. down deep state you know you're on the ground basically after the six day binge and I remember reading that you went and did the Big Sur Marathon in a drugged out state pretty much yeah and I you, was the high it was your first marathon because you had been still running so you were still functioning um and you did it in a time that I'm faster than I've ever run a marathon, and that just pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, like talk about natural ability. It's just just wrong, you know. <laughs> oh, that's so tell that thanks, story. Thanks for you... saying that. I appreciate that. Yeah. I... <laughs> uh, how how do you manage to run that fast when you're, you know, and that was your first marathon? You had no idea what you're doing. You must have been dehydrated to hell. Um, yeah. yeah. So tell a little bit about that story. Yeah, well, you know, and I, I think it, it just goes to show, though, as an addict and, and everybody who's listening to this either knows an addict, is an addict, <laughs> has, you know, contact with an addict at school, at work, or their kids or their parents or whatever. I mean, nobody escapes this uh, from your circle somehow. And so I was one of those people that I worked really hard to look good mm. in half of my life so that I could completely screw up the other half and not lose everything. So in other words, you know, I, I was the best salesman at my job so I could buy a house and I could buy a car and I could, you know, my joke used to be that nobody would ever fire the top salesman. And that that actually turned out not to be true. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, there was this, so there was this thing I wanted. So so running my first marathon was really about I was 26, I think, or 27. But, you know, it was really about uh, proving doing something else that made me look normal. Yep. Like, you know, I figured, hey, a drug addict can't run a marathon. Yeah. So if I could do this once again, I've proven to other people and maybe to myself also, that I don't have a problem. Yeah. And I was just all screwed up in the head. But on this particular, yeah, I made the decision to enter the race about a week before the race. So <laughs> needless to say, I didn't exactly prepare. Um, now, to be fair, through the years, I had tried to quit a hundred times. Yeah. Because any any addict, I mean, it's a miserable life. You yeah. know, I... There'd be brief moments of euphoria, of course, followed by an incredible amount of shame and guilt and embarrassment and all the things that go along with the stupid things that I did. Mm. Um, and so I knew that I wanted to do this marathon, but, but during, so I'm sorry, I missed my point, but during those years, I would hit bottom, straighten up for two or three months. Yep you know, get my act together, be a good boy, show up at home, show up at work, do all those things. And during that time I would run. So I, I knew, you know, like running was it throughout the years was always there for me. Mm -hmm. And I knew it's the first thing that I did when I wanted to get it back together. That's the first thing that I did was to run. And, and so I knew how to run. I had just never run a marathon. Yeah. I'd never entered or, you know, that kind of race or anything like that. And so I decided a week before this race to, you know, to go. And I had, I had been running a little bit before then and decided, hey, I'm going to do this marathon. And somehow I did know that I, I shouldn't do a bunch of training the week before the marathon because as little as I knew, even I knew, that probably wasn't very what effective. Hell? Yeah. And, you know, and consequently, I ended up with, you know, a lot of downtime in a couple of days before the race. And I don't do well. I didn't do well with downtime. Yeah. Now I'm fine. But, um, you know, and so it, it seemed like a natural thing when a buddy said, hey, let's let's go get a beer, you know, and as a true addict, 
no matter how many times I had screwed this up, I still believed that I could actually go to the bar and have two yep. beers. Yep. Like something inside me told me I could do that despite there being no evidence to that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so of course I go and I get blasted and I do drugs and I stay up the entire night and literally at whatever time in the middle of the night, early morning, you know, my, I told this guy I was with, you know, I'm going to do Big Sur Marathon tomorrow. Okay. Get up. He like looks at his watch and he's like, it is tomorrow. <laughs> you better get to the start line. Yeah, and so that's, that's what happened. And I went home and showered real quick and ran out and got on a bus and barfed my way, you know, th through the race and, <laughs> and, uh, drank as much water as I could, not to mention a couple of beers at, at mile 21 and 23 and, and uh, I mean, I managed to get through it, but I do not recommend if you're with your coaching, yeah, I don't no, think, no. <laughs> you probably shouldn't write the, uh, you know, this is not what we recommend. This is just what, no. you know, what, what you did, but, and, and, but you, when you did stop, finally running became your outlet for the emotional release. Um, because, you know, there's obviously when you're an, when you've been an, an addict or you've got any issues in life, even if you're not an addict, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of us are dealing with self-esteem issues, self-confidence issues, um, feeling like we're not good enough and, and all those sort of things. Was running, I know for me it was, running was uh, saved my life. It, it, um, it, it turned me around at a time when I'd been through an abusive relationship in my early years and, and I thought I was useless and hopeless and nothing. And, and when I did, uh, my case, I did the Marathon de Sables. It was my first race. I'd never done a marathon even. I just went straight to the Marathon de Sables and <laughs> ran that. Um, I had done a lot of other stuff before, but not actual running. And that was, for me, a turning point where, where I, I, people were telling me I was great and I was good, you know. And, and I'd been told my entire adult life that I was useless and I was hopeless at this and hopeless runner, hopeless this, hopeless at everything. And so that was for me a real turning point. And then I just wanted more and more of that, which gave me those good feelings, which was running. And so I ran and I ran and I ran and I ran. And was, that was an emotional release for me it, 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 and, a, and a confidence building thing. Um, I felt proud of myself that I could run horrifically long distances and people would go, you know, in the early days, it was really, uh, I wanted to prove something. Was that part of your process as well, you know? Yeah, for sure. And and I would say um, for a while, because in the first few years of my sobriety, you know, I ran probably, you know, 30 marathons. I did. I ran a lot of marathons. And look, I loved the marathon. And I, I thought I would be that like super old guy at 80 years old who's like crooked and, <laughs> and running down the road, running his, you know, 600th marathon. Like, and I was I was happy with that. And then something happened and, you know, I ended up doing a longer race than I had planned. And I, I was like, wow, there are actually people out here that run farther than a marathon. Like I, it's like, I didn't know that. Welcome to is, the universe of crazy yeah. ultra runners. Yeah. And that was an accidental. This is the early nineties. So there's no, you know, but there's no social media. There's no, no, like you wanted to find out about a race back then. Um, you had to read Ultra Running Magazine, which, you yeah. know, in its early days, it, it's now a, a, a beautiful, robust magazine, you know, and back then it there, you know, it was a bunch of weirdos. You know, <laughs> yeah, it was like exactly. nothing. But but to your point, so people would say even during those years, didn't they would ask me even or even accuse me and say, didn't you just switch addictions? Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure you face oh, yeah. the question to a certain degree where Absolutely. people say, you know, aren't you running too much? And it, it took me a little while to get my head around the answer because to a degree, I, I agreed with them. However, as I like to point out, you know, not one time after a run did I ever lose my car, but <laughs> after, you know, after many, after many drinking, many drinking binges, I couldn't find my car. So there was one positive, uh, yeah. Result. But in but in in seriousness, you know, addiction was all about for me not feeling good as a person. And so doing drugs allowed me to hide and to be invisible and in fact to actually feel absolutely nothing. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Like that was my goal of doing a drug or getting yep. drunk. I didn't want to feel anything yep. good Stop or bad. Pain. Yep. Yeah. I just, and I, th- who knows, there's lots of reasons why and whatever. I mean, I had my own screwed up childhood, but you know what? Uh, the vast majority of people I know Dude, have yep. their, their <laughs> own version of it. So yep. I, I don't spend a lot of time trying to seek out the, you know, the deep down why in some of that. I finally just said, okay, this is who I am. But then when I explained to people what running, I, I, I remember just saying it to somebody one day and it became clear to me. What running does is the exact opposite. With running, I'm not invisible. I'm, I'm, I'm fully present there's like a bright spotlight shining down on me and you cannot hide when you're running a marathon or a hundred miles or a stage race or a desert or there's no hiding. You're going to feel everything Mm. good and bad and difficult and happy. And, and in an ultra, as you well know, you can feel all of those things in a period of about 20 minutes. Exactly, yeah. It's like, and, and I, and that is how I explained it. So if that's addiction, it's like if, yeah, I need more of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I it's don't make positive. apologies to anybody for yeah. it. It's a positive addiction. I think it's a positive purpose driven thing that we're doing, you know, and, and, it, and if it stops us doing other things and that's a positive, um, and if it gives us focus for what we're good at, and if we use that power to then help others, like we're doing now, um, where is the negative? I don't see the negative anywhere. No, no a few months ago, somebody said, somebody said to me, and I love this, somebody said, hey, you know, did you see at the whatever Chicago Marathon or something that like three people died during the marathon? And I'm like, oh my God, that's terrible. Did you see that last weekend? Like, <laughs> 5,000 people died sitting on the sofa doing absolutely nothing. Yeah. God, I, if I were you, I wouldn't sit on your sofa and do nothing ever again in your life. Because <laughs> yeah, that sounds really dangerous to exactly. me. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, you know, we do take risks. I mean, and, and you and your story and where you've run and where I've run too, uh, we have taken risks. We have, you know, gotten away with it by the skin of our teeth sometimes. And, and you know, that, we don't need to take it to that extreme, but... Um, you can get hit by a bus, as they say, walking across the road. You know, we yeah. got to stop living. You know, um, and and why did those five three people die? Perhaps they weren't trained properly, or they had a heart attack, or right. We, who knows? People die because knows? they have. You know, our bodies hide things. You know what? If I get if I keel over in a race, or I get hit by a bus, or yep. so be it. I, I'm I'm good with that. You yep. know, I. I the experiences I've had on wow. balance, you know, through running and the places I've traveled to and the people I've met, you know, that's irreplaceable. Absolutely. Let's go through a, a little bit of a list. I mean, not your, not every race because it would be impossible to list every race that you've ever been in. But you've um, done Badwater how many times now? Uh, I did Badwater seven times. Seven so. times. I mean, freak now. That's amazing. I've done it twice and that was enough. <laughs> Um, you've done, you, you've done like, you've won the Gobi a couple of times. I know that and racing the planet you've done, the, have you done the whole racing the planet series or I, I never could afford to go to Antarctica. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> but and, sooner or later, sooner or later, I'll do that one. I hope. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. so I haven't, I haven't done that one yet. And you've done uh, uh, the eco challenge and, and, and we're part of that whole. Yeah. No, I have to tell you too, because I, I, you may know this, but so I used to do a race called the Southern Traverse in New Zealand. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Year. Yeah, so I did that a few times uh, down in, gosh, they were down in the South yeah, Island. South, there, yep. was, there was a race in Nelson in that area one year and just absolutely, I mean, it's some of my favorite memories, you know, because they're, it's such a, of course, I, I'm not just saying it because I'm talking to you and you have maybe- to. <laughs> Maybe a lot of your listeners are yeah are keys, but anyway. but they're but it's a beautiful. I mean, you know it. Yeah. it's a beautiful country, and it's um it's a sports person's paradise. I yeah. mean, it really is. it's it's mountains and water and everything in between. And uh, yeah, a friend of mine back in the day is one of your more famous uh, athletes, a guy named Steve Gurney. Who oh, I don't really? Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Steve. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Steve was Steve was one of the toughest, like 
you know, he was on some of those really great um, uh, eco challenge teams back in the day mm -hmm. and, and uh, a couple of Aussie friends of mine too. And just, you know, he was such a nice guy. And I, there was a race that he always tried to get me to do that he won every year called the Coast to Coast, I think. Yeah, that that's right? it. They've just had it yeah. recently. Yeah, he's done that. Yeah, yeah he won that. I, I don't know how many would times. like to come there and do that someday. Hey, <laughs> it, it, they have it. They had it just two weeks ago, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah a fantastic uh, event and really iconic event here. Very, very highly regarded event. Yeah. Totally. But advent look, adventure racing really taught me... I always say adventure racing taught me how to suffer. I I did a race called the Raid Goise, a French race, a few times. I did the Eco Challenge, and during that same time, I actually did. Um, I qualified for uh, for Kona Ironman in wow. 2000. So I, you know, I did that, and I did. I started doing the stage races. Similar. I mean, all of them are really based on Marathon de Sable. Yeah. Um, you know, the four deserts, and there was one in. Uh, in the Amazon, uh, the Jungle Marathon, and I did a couple over in Africa. And there, you know, what I figured out was I really liked those stage races because because of adventure racing, I was good carrying a pack. Right. Like I yep. liked carrying my gear. Yep. And because I'm never the fat, you know, I need, if I'm going to do well in a race, any race, I need there to be hardship. Yep. Like, if it's a straight out running race where the fastest guy or girl is going to win, I'm not going to win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like me. I mean, you're way better than me, but yeah, I'm the same. The harder it is, the more yeah. obstacles, the more, uh, the longer it is, the more likely yeah. I'm to do well, you know. Uh, if it's I'll take, no I'll take speed. rain, I'll take rain <laughs> snow, heat. That's why I love Death Valley. I, yeah. I, I love that heat. And I, I always know that I'm going to do. You know, I've been top like five there five wow. times. Wow. Which is which is actually better than my talent. In other words, I'm just good at that race. Yeah. And and because I really do well in the heat. And and so much more talented, faster runners than me uh will ultimately you know well, Yeah, I'm I'm actually the same. Yeah. Like I did like, better than I normally do in a race. At the two times I did bad water, uh, and same with the you know the likes of the Sahara races and the Marathon mm -hmm. Sabres and all of those sort of things. Um, and when I went to like I went up into the Himalayas and started doing races, oh man, disastrous, <laughs> disastrous. Or put me in a mountain race, you know, and I'll struggle yeah. like hell to get anywhere. So yeah, every each to their own, I suppose. We've all got our specialties at yeah. what we're good at, and heat just seems to be. But Death Valley, are you going this year? I'm trying to get there. I've got a, one of my athletes that I coach is just qualified, so I'm hoping to get there in July. Are you, are you going to oh, be there? I'm not this year. Yeah, I, oh, I made God. a decision <laughs> not to go this year. Yeah, sorry. I, I hate that. I, I love that race. And, yeah, it's uh, pretty amazing. If, anything, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. I have a lot of uh, crew contacts and people that would probably be thrilled to come Okay, yeah, we've got we've got a one of my athletes that I've been training for three years um, through, our, through our company, and um, he's from Norway, and he's just qualified. We've been inching our way towards that goal for a long time, and my husband's definitely going, and I'm trying to we're trying to get enough money to get get me over there as well. So that would be yeah. very cool. So well, if you want to pick up a crew person down in Southern California, just <laughs> let me know. I'll, you know, let me know later, and okay. I'll. I'll be so, glad to help out. Sounds awesome. Um, so, Charlie, let's go on to the, the big race, the big one. Um, when did you come up with the st stupid idea of running the entire Sahara? How did you even comprehend that? How did you logistically pull something like that together, you and Ray and Kevin? Uh, how the hell did you get Matt Damon to be the executive producer of your documentary? <laughs> let's, let's dive into that big, huge uh, thing of your life. Yeah. Yeah, that's a. It is the. It is kind of the linchpin, I guess, yeah. of my yeah. athletic career, at least up to this point. And um, sure. you know, it, it came about just because. Um, well, I always make the joke that one would think that I was drinking still, because uh, you know, it sounds like one of those ideas you say when you've had a few too many. Yeah, let's go run the Sahara. <laughs> Here's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> but no, 
I couldn't blame that. I was like, you know, 13 years sober at that point. <laughs> so no, but I was in the, um, you know, I was in the Amazon uh, doing doing the Jungle Marathon, a seven day race across the Amazon, and Ray and Kevin were both there. And and Kevin and I had been friends for a few years. He he actually was the much more talented racer at the first Gobi March, and you know I managed to beat him. Yep. Uh, just you know really lucky. Uh, he had not had the same kind of experience I had in in those conditions. But yep. anyway, so here we are in the Amazon, the three of us, and I don't know the third or fourth night you know, in between the stages, we're all laying in our, our jungle hammocks and uh, staying off the ground with all the creepy crawlies oh, down there. Yep. <laughs> and, you know, Ray had been to the Amazon, I mean, to the uh, Sahara Desert in Niger yeah. the previous year. Oh, and did he, he do that one? I, I've done he that. He did like the Trans 333 yeah. or whatever. I did yes. that too. My God, that was, I have to tell you that experience. That was the worst experience of my life. But anyway, carry on. <laughs> It was a really hard one for him too, but he actually said, "Hey, I, I did this, and and it was tough, but the the uh, the Sarah is so beautiful." And then he just said, "You know, I wonder if anybody's ever run <laughs> all the way fault. across Sarah." And I literally, I lo I looked at him and I said, "You know what? That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard." <laughs> and I mean, you'd have to be an idiot to try something like that because you can't. You know, no, you got you can't run that far in deep sand. You you can't get supplies. It's no it's hot. It's dangerous. There's food and water problems. You know, everything about it is just not possible. No. But but being the good addict that I am, I went home <laughs> back to the U.S. after the race, and I just couldn't stop got thinking upset. about it. Yeah, and it just stuck in my head and. I would think, and I started doing some research, and I found out no one had ever done it before. And, mm -hmm. you know, we all understand in this world that finding firsts in the adventure world is a pretty difficult thing to do. Very. And so I freely admit, you know, the idea was a combination of wanting to test myself, wanting to see if I could do something that had never been done before. And that, of course, is ego driven to a certain degree and why but, not <laughs> yeah but i always say to people you know yeah i picked like the most obscure sport on the planet <laughs> i reckon it's hard to make a living out of this one mate <laughs> right yeah so i'm gonna go do this thing so that i can become famous right there's a that's a brilliant <laughs> idea <laughs> there's easier ways there's easier ways <laughs> right the only way i become really famous out of this is if i you know so if i die and i'm eaten by camels or something i mean <laughs> and so Anyway, I began to plan this this idea, and, and quite frankly, everybody said it was impossible, yeah. and I wasn't even talking to Ray and Kevin during these days. I mean, we were friends, but this idea wasn't like being, like, it was just me saying, I want to become the first person to run all the way across the Sahara, and everybody told me it wasn't possible, even my friends, and I, I felt myself, you know, just dig in, you know, and I said, fine, you know, you, you can have the impossible part, and I'll take ownership of what's possible here, and, you know, and I kept just telling the story, and, and yep. I eventually I said it to the right person, Wow. and uh, I was working on a television show at the time um, called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Yeah, yep, yeah, we've got that and, here. Yeah. Yeah. So I was on the show for a few years and and uh, a friend who worked on the show said, hey, I, I know this director, you know, he won an Academy Award. Would you like to meet him? Jeez. And I went to meet James Mall and to shorten the story, he agreed to do it. And a week later, he called me and he said, hey, so we need a production company. And I just spoke with Matt Damon and. You know, Matt Matt would like to executive produce the project, and he'd like to be the narrator of the film. And he asked me, he's like, is that okay with you? Yeah, I, yeah. I think so. <laughs> right. I waited for a second, and, and uh, yeah. I said, you know, I was really hoping for somebody better. But, <laughs> but yeah, Matt Damon would be just fine. Oh, that's crazy. I mean, this is a crazy um, bunch of coincidences to get, you know, someone like that involved. And I bet, yeah. the, I bet those two had absolutely no idea what no. it actually meant to do what you were going to do. No. Uh, Nothing. So oh, no way. And, and 
you know, we finally get sponsors and money and funding and we get all this on board and we, we get, actually it's a good story because James, the director was, uh, you know, he was a very smart man and he, I'll never forget, we're sitting in Senegal, you know, two days before we're due to begin. And I'm thinking, I've suckered all of these people out here to the Sahara and we're all going to die. Oh and like, you know, because I, I mean, no, I totally anybody, get it. I totally get it. Ask me, people ask me, you know, are you sure you can do this? I'm like, yes, I'm certain. I'm positive, you know, but like if, you know, if a family member or somebody asks, I'm like going, hell no, I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> what I, how would I know? You and, don't know. Uh, you don't know. James asked me, he's like, what do you think this movie's going to be about? And I, I really just said, I have no idea. I said, but I guarantee if three runners make it all the way across the Sahara, you know, some shit's going to happen. Yeah, and it's so, going to be epic. Whatever yeah, happens, it's going to be epic. It makes sure the cameras are on. So yeah. There's going to be uh, drama. I can, yeah, there's yeah. definitely going to be drama. But to yeah. have that confidence in, your, in, you, in yourself, I mean um, – I mean, I've been, I like, you know, that Trans 333 in uh, Niger, that Ray did as well, that was hell. And that's like a segment, a tiny segment. It's really dangerous. Uh, you know, uh, it's... Well, you didn't have any support people. At least I had people most of the time out there trying to make sure I wasn't no, going to die. I got, I got food poisoning. I had a, my husband has asked for a divorce the week before. He was in the race too, and he was meant to be running with me, but he decided to go off, so I was on my own. There was only 17 of us, and so I was alone with food poisoning because the food hadn't arrived from France. So I was shitting and vomiting my way across the Sahara, passing out. Oh, possibly. my God. And then, as you know, like sometimes trucks would come along like with 150 better yeah. men on them, and you're a little yeah. girl running across the damn Sahara yeah. on your own. The, the, the chances of survival were pretty... You know, it was pretty crazy, and that's why when, yeah. when I when I you know heard that you'd done that, I was just like, you know, the logistics. I mean, I've you know ran through New Zealand as well, and I remember standing at the start line too, and that's only two thousand two hundred kilometers, and it's you know on roads and safe and everything. And I, but I felt like that too that I'd suck at everybody in, and oh my god, I've actually got to run this thing now. And then yeah. it, it suddenly dawns on you that you're responsible for a huge logistical thing and, and and all these people that are you know you've told that you're gonna i mean matt damon oh my god i can't even imagine the pressure of having james yeah. mole matt damon going yeah we're backing you you know you yeah. better you better run across the sahara you better make it <laughs> it was a lot of pressure for sure it yeah. really was and i you know i had to um as you well know from from your running career and I warned everyone involved. I'm like, the first week, it's going to seem like we're we're yep. going to die because you just kind of go down and down and down, and you your body gets worn down, and you don't sleep well, and everything about it is just is really difficult. And if you just are patient and focus on one step at a time, one day at a time, don't worry about finishing. That'll no. take care of itself if you get there, and just focus on what's right in front of you. And not, you know, and not give up. I mean, the only thing that it sounds easy to say, but you just just like running. I don't care. Just like running a hundred miler. You know, there are times in every hundred miler that I've wanted to quit yeah. every single one of yep. them. Absolutely. At some point I have said, what in the hell am I doing out here again? And what was that? Why did I think this was a good idea? And and I want to and, you know, in the the. The answer is always eat, drink, and keep moving. And wow. you know, things pretty much always get better. You know, you just you just have to be mentally prepared to say to yourself, you know that's going to happen. And I, I always say, <laughs> you as a coach will appreciate this. People ask me about marathons and you know, people, triathlete leads and marathoners especially like to train. They like to think they're gonna have the perfect race. Yeah. Like if I, yeah. if I train perfectly and I eat and drink perfectly and the weather's like, I'm going to have this. Per and I'm like, first of all, where's the fun in that? You know, I mean, <laughs> how boring, not adventure. You know, nobody ever tells stories after a race about how easy it was. <laughs> not one time have I ever heard someone say, oh my God, that was the easiest hundred miler I've ever done. <laughs> you know, yeah. because instead they're, they're telling the stories of, you know, yeah, being dehydrated and, or getting yeah. lost or being sick or their blisters or whatever, because that's what 
that's people are afraid of those things but those are the things that actually those are the rewards getting through those moments are are what it's all about well you know i really um i hope people understand the value bombs that you just dropped in the last uh, few minutes there because anyone who's listening to this really needs to rewind the tape there or <laughs> and listen to that again because that's real key advice if someone had said that to me before i did the run through new zealand for example that the first week was going to be the worst or the first two weeks so it just went Rrr. and then you, when you think there is no tomorrow there is no way I can take even another step and you're so injured and you're so broken that that's when the body starts to come right it's almost like a it's almost like a, a, a the body and the mind are trying to sabotage you because it thinks oh, yeah. we're in survival mode we've got to stop her somehow so let's make everything hurt and yeah. stop her, and if she doesn't, oh shoot, we better get on with it because obviously she's not listening. <laughs> you know, so the body is like going. The body is saying, "This person is trying to kill me," yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm having none of it. And then, and then it is. It's an amazingly resilient. You know, you got to just like fuel for your car. You know, you got to feed it. You got to. Yep. You got to water it. You got to do all those things maintenance wise. And if you keep doing that and you just get up and you keep moving every day, or if you're in a race, a very long single race, you know, I always say the chair is the enemy. You yep. know, you just, you're much better off grabbing food and drink and maybe sit for two minutes, but have someone there for you that's going to say, okay, okay time to go. Yep. Kick get, you up, bad, get up, get out of here and just walk, you know, just, just walk and eat a thousand calories if that's what you need and and keep moving. And it's just amazing how, you know, the body will obey what the mind commands it to do. Yeah. And that sounds so easy, but that is the actual science of yeah. what all the experience that you have saying that is um is is really key. And and I think people have this with well, people who haven't done ultras have this misconception that we never walk. And, and that walking is not a good thing in an ultra. Um, I mean, what's your opinion on that? Oh, I walk my ass off and I <laughs> yeah, walk faster. Exactly. You know, <laughs> the thing is, I walk faster than, you know, I mean, I, I, run. I, yeah. I practice. You know, the things I practice, I practice downhill running and I practice walking, mm -hmm. you know, and of course I do my normal running. But, you know, my experience through the years is, you use way too much gas trying to run outrun people going up steep hills yep. because it just is pointless. It makes, you know, to use all that effort to try to stay with someone, whereas if, if they get 30 seconds or even a minute ahead of me, like at Badwater is a great example, you know, I go all the way up that 18 miles from Stovepipe, you yep. know, up to Town Pass. And it's 14 miles down the other side. Lots of people will pass me on that stretch. Yep. And, and I will pass every single one of them on the other side. Yep. And I have burned yeah. all that gas getting up to the top. And it happens every single time. And there's just, I mean, I think walking is uh, some of my fastest marathons even. And I'm, I was never a super speedy marathoner, but I mean, I, I ran several dozen marathons under three hours wow. and, That's fast. you know, and, and even during those times I walk during all the, the, uh, you know, water, water. stops, yep. those kind of things, because you clear out a little bit of lactic acid. I mean, you're, you give away so much, especially in an ultra, when you finally hit a point where you're not just walking, you're practically crawling. Yep you give away so much more time that if early in the race, if you had just saved some of that energy, because it, it's hard, I get it. In the first 20 miles of a 100 miler, yeah, you're it's, thinking, it's difficult to make yourself fast walk a steep hill. But I do it every time because there's yeah. just no... Because you're experienced. You know. Yeah, and, and in your mind, you're thinking, oh my goodness, if I'm walking already in, at, at mile 15, how the hell am yeah. I going to run 100 miles? But right. it, it, yeah. it, it stops that whole process. It actually slows the lactic acid build up. It, it stops you going into that uh, survival mode where the brain starts to really freak out and try and stop you recruiting your muscles. Yeah. So I hope people are really listening to that and take that on board, that, that walking is a part of the, the, the run. If you're doing ultras, it's a part of the run training. And I know, like, you know, when you come from the marathon scene where it's all about, you know, running the entire distance it's it's a mindset shift 
uh, it's also a big mindset shift when you go from road to trail, I think, and when you oh, go yeah. hills. Uh, and it, it, it's not – I remember someone saying to me when they watched a documentary of me doing Death Valley and they said, well, it doesn't look very athletic. You're very <laughs> slow, you know, and I thought – you couldn't even run around a tree in Death Valley, man. Yeah. It is so hot that everything has to re- be relative. You have to drop the pace yeah. or when I've been at altitude up, you know, around 5,800 meters or whatever, and you're walking and people are going, well, you're only walking. I, I'm walking yeah. after 40 hours at, at altitude and 5,800 and minus degrees and they just don't get it when you've just done a city marathon or you've done a, you know, you're a road runner. Uh, it's, it's a different yeah. mentality, isn't it? Well, my, my goal is always efficiency, you know, and, yep. and you know, there's Killian Journey and there's a few people out there that don't, you know, they don't count no, because they're, they're, just, they're just, you know, there's just something, you know, that they have. They're, they're the Michael Jordans of, of the sport. And, so the rules don't really apply to them. But for the vast majority of us, even even people even like me ones. who will, you know, I'll usually finish in the top whatever percent of a of a race and and do pretty well. I, I have to, you know, I have to gauge my my effort. Uh, I know that the goal is for me to first of all, my hope is to run a negative split. And I've actually run a negative split at, at Badwater a couple of times. Wow. Oh. Which is not, not easy to no. do. Hell no. So, because it takes a lot of patience to wait until the second half of a race to go faster. And and that I think that goes to this point. And I'm not I'm not an advice giver. I only tell people what I do and wouldn't wouldn't dare tell somebody else what to do because I'm not I'm not good at it. But <laughs> I get the question all the time about, um, you know, I want to go from the marathon to running ultras. You know, what do I, how should I do that? What do I do? And I'm usually a very much a smart ass. And I say, okay, you know, do you, own, yeah, do you own a computer? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, okay, find a race, <laughs> enter it. Enter it and do it. And go do it. And, and you know, because that's the only you know, there's always this fear of the unknown, but but you and I both know, you know, a 50 miler is not twice as hard as a marathon and a no. hundred miler isn't four times as hard as a marathon. It's different. It's different. It's, hard. it's a different hard. And it's uh, in some ways, I think it's easier. Um, I mean, some of the hardest races I've ever had were running marathons when I was trying to go my fastest. Yeah, PB, yep. Yep. So for freaking three hours, I was on, you know, I was redlining and like I was on that edge of, of catastrophe all the time. And I try to never get to that point in an ultra. Yeah. You know, I, I want to maintain a pace that I can, can keep going. Miles and, yeah. Time. Yeah. and it yeah. takes patience and it takes learning. I say the same thing about marathons too, though. Why, you know, you're in a safe environment. You're surrounded by lots of staff people. You got a medical people. You got other runners around. You know the basics. Just go out there and do it. And (laughs) whether whether you you know fall on your face and you end up walking the last ten miles, or you have a personal record, you know you're going to learn from it, and you're not going to die. You really aren't. Every once in a while, somebody does, but that's that's (laughs) it's just statistics. Yeah. yeah. Just... And you're going to learn. You're going to learn some things. And so don't be afraid. You know, the one of the biggest uh, dangers is is people worrying about what they're going to look like on social media. And <laughs> I've mastered the art of looking like, you know, an ass on social media because I don't I don't mind sharing my failures. You yeah. know, I'll I'll share successes, too. But I want people to see that. That's heartwarming. No. That's fantastic. I, I love that open, you know, and, and I, I truly believe that, especially when you, when you are a role model like you are, or even like with the stuff that I do, it's so important that you don't candy coat and make it all look plastic and beautiful and shiny because it's about the failures, you know, and we've fallen on our asses many times, both of us, and that is a part of the experience that we have and the mistakes that we make, and that's why we can, you know, share this yeah. and, and teach and then do it better next time you know failures and pain and and suffering and and um don't be afraid of that people you know that is what life is about you know if you, I if just you live wanna, in a bubble i just want to have 
when I, when my ass is sitting on a rocking chair somewhere, you know, <laughs> yeah. at some point, hopefully a long time long in the future, life. I just want to have a bunch of good stories. That's all. Well, Gene, you, you got know? those. And, <laughs> you know, and we, we all, you know, I, the, the men and women I've known who, who've gotten older and you go visit and, you know, they talk about, yeah, they talk about life. They talk about travel and, and running and, and, you know, men or women, depending on your preference. And, you know, they talk about life. They don't talk about, you know, how much they worked. And, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I think that what running does I consider it cultural exploration. You know, when I go places, I get to encounter people in in a way where I'm not pulling up in some fancy yeah, car. You're not I'm threatening. running. I'm yep. running with them. You know, it's a very human way to to get around the world, and it's something that we've always done throughout the centuries, and it takes away those boundaries. Yeah, um, and and I think um, too when you're when you're out there you know, running with other people, you know, you either, it brings out the best and it brings out the worst in people, doesn't it? Um, oh, you you gosh, cannot yeah. hide your your personality. You cannot hide uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, and you oh. make the best mates and you have people that you never want to see again. Those, that's yeah. the flip side. Well, and look, running the Sahara was interesting for me. You know, anybody that's ever seen the film mm. will know that, you know, I wasn't always the nicest guy. Although, you know, I always say that some of that was, you know, look. That's movie when you shoot, making. When you, right. When you shoot 500 hours of footage and you have 90 minutes to make a film, you know, the director. It's going to pick who, the drama. Who, yeah, I respect greatly. But he, you know, he twisted the story up some on camera. And, and he personally, he made me look like both the good guy and the bad guy at times. And I always say that, you know what, I'm, I can live with that. You know, I'm. I, I think like most of us, I think I'm, I, I think I'm nice most of the time and I'm not nice some of the other times. Yes. And, and as I was saying earlier, you know, I think the, it's given me a lot of opportunities to recognize my own faults and, and to know hopefully when to say, Hey, sorry about that. You know, I didn't mean to and yet, yell at you or whatever. The extreme <laughs> pressure when you're under exhaustion and fatigue of those sort of levels, I mean, it's really hard not to lose the plot. I mean, there have been a couple of times with me with my crews that I've completely lost yeah. the plot at them when I shouldn't have. Um, yeah. So you're, you know, you, you got, like, well, people have to understand a little bit that you're in extreme pressure and extreme pain uh, and fear. You also and, choose wisely the people that you surround yourself with. You do in the end. <laughs> you don't, at the no. beginning, maybe not. But yeah, and, yeah. and you know, you can't be perfect all the time, can you? It's just no. impossible. Well, and I always say, you know, surround yourself with people that will love you and, and forgive you also for your shortcomings. And I, I try to be that person for other people and, and to understand they're not going to be perfect. And, uh, you know, life is complicated for all of us. And again, <laughs> I chose to put myself out there a couple of times yeah. where I'm, you know, I'm on, I'm on film and there's a story. And so people, people might think that they actually know me based on what they've seen in, yeah. you know, a brief, yeah. whatever. Twist, it's like twisted I, plot. <laughs> yeah, I always make the joke that if someone had a like a, a a gym coach who yelled at them, then then they don't like me because they they somehow relate me to that guy that used to yell at them all. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I bet the gym coach got the results too. You know, it yeah, gets results. Well, you know, you got them through. I, I will say, you know, with Sahara. I'm not shy about the fact that, and, and I mean, my teammates say the same, and that is that we, you know, we wouldn't have, wouldn't have survived. you didn't even, you didn't even see, you know, half the pushing that I did behind the scenes because we had an unbelievable number of logistical problems and mm. money problems and what, I mean, every problem you could have, we had out there, but I told everyone from the very beginning, I don't care if I have to like grab, you know, a camel and a couple of boxes of Snickers bars, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep going. Like yeah. I'm going to keep going until there's nowhere else to go. And, and we're going to make it, you know, if you just, you know, yep. if we just keep moving, yep. we're going to make it. And, 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 and it need, to, 
to have a vision like that, you need to be a visionary and you need to have that drive that is beyond, you know, beyond belief, really. And, and um, that is part of, you know, who you are. Um, Charlie, can I just talk to you about your like You've got a book, uh, Running Man, that's out and available for people to read if they want to read your whole story. Um, mm-hmm. And you've, you've had a few dramas in the last years with the bloody federal prison. I think it's an absolute travesty what happened to you and I've only known what's you know been put out in the media um and it seems to me that you were a scapegoat for what the hell are those people that actually caused the whole home loan mortgage crash or financial crash of those years uh who are you know never saw the inside of a a prison cell um and the small person was victimized uh, for doing nothing I mean tell us in your own words what you learned out of that whole crappy part that happened to you and and why did that horrible excuse for a human pick on you to make you know to go after you like that when what where the the hell did you come from well it's a good question in in the what's funny or not funny funny is a always (laughs) weird word but you know there's you know running the sahara sort of put me on the map you know but both, you know, outside of the running world, you know, maybe some people knew me in the running world before that, but outside of the running world, you know, and certainly in my community, I became more well known after that. And, and I attracted a lot of really great attention and I attracted some not so great attention. And in short, for listeners, you know, you can Google the heck out of it and find all the explanations or you can read my book, which Mm. would be preferable to me. Mm. Um, but the short of it is, you know, I was the first and only person at the time to actually be charged with overstating my income on a home loan application. I mean, what the hell is that anyway? You I mean, don't even know. Why is it's that a, a criminal very, thing? You know, like it's a very embarrassing crime. I never could figure out like what kind of <laughs> what kind of prison tattoo am I going to get for that? Like a like a fountain pen or something? I mean, it just was. It just you it know seems so uh, so weird. When all these bankers and you know Wall Street people who absolutely caused havoc throughout the entire economy, when you've got president, I don't know what you think about Trump, but if you you know you've got president yes, who's yeah. Trump who's <laughs> gone bankrupt, I don't know how many times and sent so many people out, and he's the damn president yeah. of the country. Uh, yeah, well, you know me well enough. You know me well enough to know already what I think about him. But uh, well, I think we agree. Yeah, know, I mean it's. It is a, and in all fairness, you know, and I do, I do try to be not always politically unfair and I don't want to talk politics, but, you know, I was a big fan of Obama and I I still am, but but interestingly, he's the one that sent me to prison. So (laughs) while, you know, the mess wasn't his fault, you know, the mess came from the previous administration, you know, he took over and. 2008 and when things were really falling apart yeah, at totally. point. and you know and the justice department decided they needed to try to find some people to to blame and they didn't prosecute a single banker no. uh, uh you know or real estate you know magnet or any of the people who actually made or their own financial regulators you know but they came after a few little guys fries like me and and look one of the unfortunately i'm i'm sure it's not you know i'm sure the same could be said in in new zealand or just about anywhere if you're not a person that has a lot of money and like i said i certainly didn't become an ultra runner to i like here's a great way to make a lot of money <laughs> god no it's uh, a good way to go broke actually yeah. <laughs> well, I was actually an easy target. You know, I had some I had some notoriety. Yeah, I didn't have any money to speak of, you know, certainly not enough. You know, you you get charged with a crime like that here in the U.S. You know, you can't get an attorney to even talk to you for less than 300 grand. And that's like up front. Mm-hmm. Like so there's no there's no there's, there's no, no upside to it. So so there's no hope of no. defense. There's no hope of no. No, and really there's no hope of winning. You know, I did go to trial and I did fight it because I wasn't going to admit to something that I didn't do. And ultimately, and ironically, I was found not guilty of those crimes. I was found not guilty at trial of giving false information. But through a technicality of 
the fact that I signed a closing package and anybody that's ever purchased a property, I'm sure it's the same there as it is yeah. here. You sign, you sign a big giant stack of papers that your attorney you tells never you read. Not, yeah, that you don't understand. Right, you don't read. And, you know, and ultimately that stack of papers had some information in it that was put there by my mortgage broker, very crooked guy. And, you know, and my signature basically attested to it. And despite the fact that it was acknowledged that I'm not the one that did it, uh, I was still held responsible. So, Oh, you know, absolutely brilliant. Look, I, yeah. I was, it's, yeah, and so I was found guilty at trial, and I was sentenced to 21 months in federal prison. And you know, I essentially had my, you know, my life and my freedom for a while taken away. Horrible. And so, here's the thing, and and to not make this a so it isn't like some horrible tale. And again, I do talk a lot about it in in the book. Mm. You know, I would never. have I certainly am not implying that I would choose to have that experience or that uh, that it was good for me in every way. But thanks to being at that time 19 years sober, I had done a lot of really hard running in my life. And I understood the patience that we've talked about here, you know, mm -hmm. today and this this idea that if you always just keep moving forward, things mm -hmm. will work out. And I approached prison the same way. You know, I, I certainly wasn't looking forward to going, but I accepted the fact that I was going and there was nothing I could do about it. Yep. And once, once I reached that place of acceptance, I went in there and I did exactly what I, what I hope I always do. I, I went in and I knew that my happiness was completely up to me and nobody else. And you know, I went in there and I started running. And uh, you took you a whole know, lot of guys with you. Yeah, when I got there, there were like three people running on this track. There were, out of four hundred inmates, there were really no no runners. There were a lot of guys doing push ups and pull ups and the normal stuff. And you know, by the time I left, uh, eighteen months later, you know, there were about fifty guys in my running group. And you know, we even did yoga out on the softball field a few days a week. And Awesome. Uh, you know, I will say that the first time I did yoga out there by myself in the middle of a softball field was a, was not a comfortable, <laughs> I don't, I don't recommend doing yoga in prison by yourself, <laughs> you know, on the softball field. So Good way to get in trouble, I'd say. Oh. I was harassed a bit, but, yeah. uh, you know, it all worked out and, and I did. And I, I also, I got an opportunity to be in there and see you know, I'm not shy about the fact that we have a horrendous criminal justice system here where, yeah. you know, it's a business. And if you have a problem with drugs and alcohol, you're much more likely to end up in prison than in a treatment center. And, you know, no matter what somebody's attitude is about about it being a crime, the reality is it makes no fiscal sense. It costs a lot more money to put somebody in prison than it does to try to get them help. Um, it's nobody ever gets out of prison better. No, no. <laughs> you know, you don't get better while you're in there, while you're locked away. And so when you get out, you have much less opportunity to actually get a job. Yeah. I tell people all the time, you know, so I was in there with guys who had 20 or 25 years for minor drug convictions. And, That's you know, Nobody else on the planet does it. You know, we, we, and again, you see, I mean, not to be, uh, put a timestamp on this, uh, this podcast, but you know, the recent shooting in Florida and all this nonsense we yeah. talk about with, with guns, you know, other countries, yours included, have yeah. proven over and over again that there's one way to stop these things yeah. from happening. Don't get rid of the gun. Them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. We, and, we can't you know, understand it. I can't understand well, you know, it at all. I don't want to turn this into a political talk, but I will just say this one thing. I said it earlier today to my wife. We were talking. I'm like, look, you know, we in this country are allowed, you know, organizations like the NRA and others are allowed to give politicians huge amounts of money. I'm so like, well. at least... At least in third world countries, bribery is done in the dark <laughs> and under the table. You know, here we just let we just let the lobbyists and the big organizations give the politicians big piles of money, and and they all pretend like it's not 
for anything. Yeah, right. Oh, we just want you to have these millions of dollars. You know, we don't care what you do with it. And and that's just such it's just nonsense. And, and the same is true for the justice system here. So to get back to your question, because I don't want to dwell on this for me personally, I learned a lot and and I learned that I had no stomach for complaining about what had happened to me. I got 21 months that I had to do 18 months of. There's guys in there with 25 years for minor infractions who most of them, you know, people of color also. So, yeah. you know, if you're if you're a minority, you know, you have a much greater chance of going to and you know, so who am I to complain about what happened to me? I mean, yeah. it was it was unfair, it yeah. was unjust, but it gave me an opportunity. You know what it did, Lisa? It gave me an opportunity to put to to work all the stuff that I told other people through the years. Because what I'd said for my entire existence in sobriety up to that point was it doesn't matter what happens to you, it only matters what you do about it. Yep. You had to put your and, money where your mouth was in that case and, uh, and and you turned a, a a negative thing, if you like, and, and you saw the silver lining, and you helped other people while you were there. And you've and you've gotten out, and you've turned. I mean, you're back. You're back into stuff again. You've written your book. Your your life's back on track, and you're back out running. Uh, you know, and, and it's a hopeful story, I think. And it's also, you know, the, the resilience of the human heart and spirit to overcome horrific things like that but also the 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 stuff that you've achieved running wise and the stuff that you got got through with your sobriety and and all the rest of it an amazing life what a life it's insane it's crazy i wouldn't trade it <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't trade it you know i i would yeah i mean i made mistakes and and uh, i've done a lot of good things too and you know, I, I think, again, I, I know you've done some positive, lots of positive things yourself, but uh, back to the Sahara, I always forget to mention this, but, you know, the best thing to come out of that is that Matt Damon and I actually co-founded a water nonprofit called H2O Africa, but now now that nonprofit is called water.org, mm -hmm. and if you ever see Matt Damon um, doing, he does a lot of advertising for this nonprofit, so my my run across the Sahara, this stupid, crazy, idiotic idea uh, laid the groundwork for what is now the largest water nonprofit, the most successful not water nonprofit in the world. Wow. That, that, and the people that get that water, they don't know I ran across the Sahara and they don't care. No. And I don't, I don't, they don't need to know. No. <laughs> and, and but I know. You know, I get to know that that it was the catalyst for something good. And, and we Wonderful. all forget sometimes that, you know, the, the little things I go back to when Ray said to me in the Amazon, you know, just words said to me in passing, you know, about the Sahara Desert, you know, things were so connected to each other and, and little things that somebody says to you in an elevator or on an airplane or some stranger can change the course of your entire life. And other people's you lives. Know, yep. You have to pay attention. Yep, absolutely. You never know when some magic moment's going to happen and, and something amazing is going to come out of it, or you know, and you never know how you can turn something that you've experienced that was negative for you into a positive that helps other people. And that, I think, is a perfect note to finish on. Hey, Charlie, yeah. Charlie, you've been Agreed. so, so, so generous with your, your story, your, your openness, your genuineness, your craziness, which I think is, you know, in, in a good way. Um, uh, and, and I really appreciate you sharing your journey. And um, I'm in total awe of you. I think um, I, I can't wait to hear what your next uh, mission is, running or otherwise. Uh, yeah. and uh, I look forward to connecting. And if you're over in New Zealand, New Zealand, mate, you know, you have to come and stay. hundred <laughs> percent. No, I, I love it. I, and I will, I'll, next time I'll tell you, I've got a big project for next year, but we'll tease that and save it for the next okay. time. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm easy to find for all your folks there. You know, yeah, I have where a, do we find you? Is, yep. The website is just my name, just charlieengel.com. And I'm, I'm mostly an Instagram person these days, so you know if you if you want to follow just kind of whatever just I'm up at to. Charlie Engel on Instagram. That's it. 
And That's it. your book is Running Man. And where can people get that? Just on your website or? Yeah, yep. and I mean, Amazon is probably the biggest supplier here, so I don't know if that's the yeah, same. Yeah, we have a bit of trouble with Amazon over here. We don't always get it, but I'm sure people can get it. Um, there's, 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 you know, a few ways that they can get I it. I know it's a lot of independent bookstores there, and so whatever the – I've sold a lot of books over there, and it, yeah. and it is – a lot of people buy the audio book, which it does mean that you have to listen to me for like 10 hours. <laughs> But um, awesome. I had to audition. I had to audition to read my own audio book, which was pretty funny. But um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, a lot of runners like to to listen because it's it's what they do when they go out on their run. So yeah. I'm just uh, doing a copy of my uh, first book. Actually, is an audio format, and uh, I'm hopeless at it. So I, w I would have failed if I, I'm just doing it on my own. <laughs> anyway, it's hard. It's bloody it? hard. It's horrible yeah. listening to your own story and listening to your own voice. Um, yeah. But Hey, Charlie, okay. thanks once again for your, you. your time today, and we'll, we'll catch up with you again, too, I hope, mate. Okay, Lisa, thank you. All right. That's it for this episode of Pushing the Limits with your host, Lisa Tamati. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, and share all this goodness with your networks so we can impact more lives with positive insights and inspiring conversations. And check us out online at www.lisatamati.co.nz.